Complex numbers can sometimes seem like magic, or as some people would call them, unreasonably effective. They're just so useful in so many contexts that they seem to have no business being involved in. For instance, you might have heard of Fourier analysis, which says we can break any signal down into a sum of sine and cosine waves. Well, it turns out that if you swap out the real sinusoids and real coefficients for complex sinusoids and complex coefficients, the analysis gets a lot easier. Electrical engineers will also use complex numbers to analyze certain types of circuits. They'll model components and voltages with complex numbers, and this somehow lets them get around having to solve differential equations. Jumping to discrete math, you can craft a special type of function called a generating function. And if you evaluate it with complex numbers, you can solve a subset counting problem. Quantum mechanics uses complex numbers all the time to predict the behavior of real particles all around us, and it does so with astonishing accuracy. It's actually responsible for the most accurate prediction ever made in the history of science. The imaginary number i was first discovered slash invented as a necessity to solve certain polynomials, but now it's managed to worm its way into so many other parts of math, science, and engineering. But why do all these applications need the square roots of negative numbers? This isn't a new question, and there are a lot of justifications out there on why i is so fundamental. But a lot of the time, they lean on Euler's formula. Now, Euler's formula is super cool, but I don't think it's a good answer here. I think it justifies the mechanics of using complex numbers, but to me, it doesn't really explain the core properties of those numbers. I believe the reason complex numbers are so effective is because a single complex number captures two properties at the same time, magnitude and phase. And on top of that, complex numbers also capture the transformation of these properties. That is, complex numbers also represent scaling and rotating. Now, I'm by no means the first person to connect complex numbers to rotation. However, these properties are usually presented as a neat byproduct of the way complex multiplication works. But that just feels so unsatisfying to me. It feels like the only reason for using the complex numbers is that the mechanics just happen to mirror the problem we're applying them to. So today, I want to flip the script. I think that scaling and rotating are the fundamental behaviors of complex numbers, and the square root of negative one, well, it's actually just a symptom and not a cause. While it might seem like I'm just splitting hairs here, I think this viewpoint helps demystify the complex numbers by getting to the heart of what they really are, and so their connection to the problems we apply them to becomes more intimate. It's not that they just happen to work really well, you know, by coincidence. They're intrinsically the types of numbers that you'd want to use. We'll justify this viewpoint by deriving the complex numbers from scratch. We'll start out with some objects that have magnitude and phase, and we'll show that just by thinking about them geometrically, you unavoidably end up discovering the square root of negative one and the complex numbers as a whole. Before we get into that though, I think a good thing to talk about is, what does it even mean for a number to have phase? It's actually quite easy to demonstrate what having phase means by making an analogy to waves. Here, I have a red and blue wave, both of which have the same amplitude. Remember the amplitude of a wave is just how tall it is, and the phase of a wave tells us how much it's been shifted left or right. We'll fix the phase of the red wave, and we'll play around with the phase of the blue wave. We're particularly interested in the sum of the red and blue waves, which I'll draw as this purple wave. Now, if the red and blue waves are perfectly in phase, the amplitude of the purple wave will be the sum of the amplitudes of the red and blue waves. But if the red and blue waves are out of phase by pi radians, or 180 degrees, they'll perfectly cancel out, and the purple wave will have an amplitude of zero. Now, if the red and blue waves are only partially out of phase, then they'll only partially cancel out. The lesson here is that even though the red and blue waves had the same fixed amplitudes, their sum could have a range of amplitudes based on their phase difference. Real numbers don't exhibit these kind of behaviors. Real numbers do indeed have a notion of amplitude, it's their absolute value, or how far from zero they are on a number line. But unlike waves which have a range of possible phases, real numbers only have two distinct phases positive and negative. Two real numbers with the same amplitude can constructively interfere if they have the same phase, that is, if they have the same sign. So for instance, three plus three gives you six. Their amplitudes have added. Real numbers can also destructively interfere if they're completely out of phase, that is, if they have opposite signs. So for instance, three plus negative three gives you zero. They both have the same amplitude, but it canceled out. Unfortunately, real numbers that have the same amplitude can't partially cancel out. Complex numbers can do this, though. As an example, take the numbers 1 and i. 
they both have a magnitude of 1. The sum of their magnitudes is then 2. If we take the magnitude of their sum though, we get the square root of 2, which is about 1.4. So adding them together made them cancel out a bit, but not completely. We'll now prove to ourselves that magnitude and phase are the true fundamental properties of complex numbers. We'll start by assuming that we have some generic polar objects with these properties, and we'll see that this assumption, along with just some simple geometric reasoning, is all it takes to end up with the square root of negative 1. Real quick, we'll use this notation to denote a polar object with magnitude a and phase theta, and I'll pronounce it as a angle theta. Since our polar objects have magnitude and phase, we can visualize them as arrows on a 2D plane. A polar object basically tells you how far to walk from the origin and in what direction. Adding two polar objects means that we want to follow the directions of the first polar object and then follow the directions of the second polar object. Geometrically, this means starting the second arrow where the first one ends, and the sum is an arrow that goes from the beginning of the first arrow to the end of the second. Now, Remember that we want our polar objects to also represent rotation and scaling. Since the magnitude of a polar object is a scalar and its phase is an angle, it's natural to have a polar object with magnitude b and phase v represent the combined transformations of scaling by a factor b and rotating by an angle of phi radians. We can use multiplication to apply this transformation to other polar objects. Suppose we want to apply the transformation b angle phi to another polar object a theta. We can scale it by a factor of b by multiplying the magnitude by b, and we can rotate it by phi radians by adding phi radians to the phase. So b angle phi times a angle theta should be b times a angle theta plus phi. It's easy to come up with polar objects that do just rotation or just scaling. If we have a polar object with magnitude 1 and phase phi, then it just does a rotation by phi radians and it leaves the magnitude unchanged. If we have a polar object with magnitude b and phase uh, 0, then all it does is scale by a factor of b, and it leaves the phase unchanged. Let's not make a huge leap towards discovering i by asking the question, what happens when we multiply a polar object by negative 1? The negative of any object is just another object that you can add to the first one to get 0. So if I have an arrow a angle theta, what should its negative look like? The key insight is that the negative of a polar object is itself just rotated by pi radians, or 180 degrees. Let's think about that intuitively. Remember that you can think of a polar object as telling you how far to walk and in what direction. The negative of a polar object should be something that cancels it out, meaning that if you follow the directions of the original polar object and then you follow the directions of its negative, you should end up back where you started. Well, let's say that I made you walk 10 paces in some arbitrary direction, and then I said to come back to where you started. What would you do? Well, you'd turn around 180 degrees and then just walk 10 paces again. So basically, negative 1 times a angle theta and a angle theta plus pi are the same object because they both cancel out a angle theta. Let's factor out the rotation by pi radians and on the right-hand side of the equation. Now, since the real number negative 1 and the polar object 1 angle pi both have the same effect on a angle theta, they must be the same thing. And honestly, that right there is really what makes the complex number special. It's not about square roots, it's about the connection between negation and rotation. However, I'm not just gonna stop here because I did promise you the square root of negative one. Well, before we talk about roots, we're gonna need to talk about exponentiation. Now, we're gonna only apply these operations to polar objects that represent rotations, that is, polar objects that have magnitude one and some phase phi. Let's start by exponentiating. Taking anything to the power of n means performing n repeated multiplications. Since multiplying a polar object means applying a transformation, n repeated multiplications means n repeated transformations. In terms of geometry, one angle phi to the nth power is the same thing as applying n rotations, each one being phi radians. So one angle phi to the power of n is a rotation of n times phi radians. And this is given by the polar object 1 angle n times phi. The root operation then becomes easy to define because it's just the opposite of what our ex exponentiation does. If raising to the nth power multiplies the rotation angle by a factor of n, then taking the nth root should divide it by a factor of n. Alright, at long last, it's time for the grand finale. 
let's ask the question, what happens if you take the square root of the polar object, one angle pi? Well, this corresponds to cutting the rotation angle in half. So the square root of the polar object, one angle pi, is the polar object, one angle pi over two. Well, remember earlier that we said that one angle pi and negative one are the same object. So we'll substitute in negative one and, hey, would you look at that? We've discovered the square root of negative one. Turns out it's just a 90 degree rotation. To see that our polar objects are exactly the complex numbers, we first need to make an interesting connection between polar objects without face and the real numbers. We'll do this by considering what happens when we multiply a polar object by a real number. Multiplying anything with a coefficient implies repeated addition. So n times a angle theta is just adding n copies of a angle theta together. Since all the arrows are in the same direction, the resulting sum is also going to be an arrow in the same direction, just n times longer. Since multiplying any polar object by a real number gives the same answer as multiplying it by the, scalar polar op the scaling polar object n angle zero, they must be the same thing. And you know, that honestly feels pretty intuitive. I mean, if a polar object has no phase, all it has is a magnitude, and so it's no better than a real number. Now, to get to the complex numbers, we just need to notice that by simple geometric reasoning, any polar object A angle theta can be turned into the sum of a horizontal arrow and a vertical arrow. Notice that this forms a right triangle, and so we can use trigonometry to find the magnitudes of the legs. The horizontal arrow is a polar object with a magnitude of A cos theta and a phase of zero and that means it's the same as the real number a cos theta. The vertical arrow is a polar object with magnitude of a sine theta and a phase of 90 degrees, or pi over two radians. We can go ahead and factor out the a sine theta as a real coefficient. Well, we saw earl earlier that one angle pi over two is the same as the square root of negative one. So we'll go ahead and we'll substitute that in as well. Thus, we see that every polar object is the sum of a real number and a scaled version of the square root of negative one. And that means that every polar object is a complex number. It's worth taking a second to appreciate the fact that we seem to have derived the complex numbers. At no point did we assume that the square root of negative one was a thing, but once we saw that negating could be framed as a rotation, then it was inevitable that it would exist, just because taking roots means dividing up that rotation. And that's why I personally prefer the geometric view of the complex numbers. It makes the square root of negative one intuitive, Sure, the square roots of negatives may be a weird thing to think about when we're talking about the real numbers, but it's a supernatural thing to think about in geometry. And that explains why complex numbers are so useful in so many contexts. It's not because we need the square root of negative one, it's because we need the geometry of the complex numbers. Now, earlier I said that I don't think Euler's formula is a good justification for the usefulness of complex numbers, but you might be thinking, doesn't Euler's formula also basically just said everything you did? And in fact, if you plug in pi, you get e to the i pi is negative one. Doesn't that also say that a rotation by pi radians is the same as negating? Well, I think we maybe have a difference of interpretation here. I think the point of the formula is that you can represent a complex number in polar form as an exponential. The fact that this exponential can be decomposed into a cosine and a sine is just how all polar to Cartesian decomposition works. And it's just because of basic geometry. Remember when we turned a angle theta into a vertical and horizontal component? We saw that it made a right triangle and that's why sine and cosine got involved. Euler's formula says the same thing that we did, it just replaces a angle theta with a times e to the i theta and it replaces one angle pi over two, the imaginary unit i. So we already had the sine and the cosine, so that's not really the cool part. What is cool is the fact that we can use Euler's number e and represent polar objects as exponentials. All right, let's now take our refreshed view of the complex numbers and apply it to a classic example, the Fourier series. According to Fourier, any periodic signal can be broken up into sines and cosines. However, we can rework this formulation to give us some insight. If we combine the two sums, we get a linear combination of a sine and a cosine. And that's just the same thing as a single cosine with an amplitude and phase determined by the original coefficients. So what Fourier analysis says is that any signal can be broken down into sinusoids, but you need to know how to scale and how to phase shift each one before combining them together. Now, let's look at the complex Fourier series. 
We'll go ahead and replace the complex exponential with the polar object so that we aren't tempted to think about Euler's formula. The complex exponential is equivalent to a polar object with a magnitude of 1 and a phase that changes constantly at a rate of n times omega. This is a complex sinusoid, and if you graph it, it looks like this corkscrew. It's in 3D because there's a real and an imaginary axis along with the time axis. The coefficient itself is also a complex number, and so we can represent it as some polar object with a magnitude a sub n and a phase phi sub n. If we multiply out the coefficient and the sinusoid, we see that the complex sinusoid is scaled by a factor of a sub n, and its phase is shifted by a constant offset of phi sub n. And so now we can see exactly why the complex version of Fourier series is so elegant. Fourier series only works if you can scale and phase shift the sinusoids before combining them. And these are transformations that are naturally captured by the complex numbers. The reason we use complex sinusoids instead of real sinusoids is because they can easily be both scaled and phase shifted just by multiplying them with the single complex number. Now, I wish I could go over all the other use cases of complex numbers and explain how the geometric perspective simplifies them. But if I did all that, this video would just be too long. However, I'm hoping that I've given you enough insight that you can go and look at those other examples on your own. Just remember, if you ever find yourself looking at a use case of complex numbers and they seem to be unreasonably effective, you can make them seem more reasonable by asking yourself, can I reformulate this problem to be a geometry problem that talks about rotating and scaling? Or, Am I working in a context where the effects of phase are crucial and considering magnitude alone is insufficient? These are the questions that will inspire a light bulb moment and help show why using the complex numbers makes problems simple. 